Podcast 5 of the Abdomen Series, The Large Intestine. This podcast is going to continue detailing the intestines by looking at the anatomy of the large intestine, including the structure, position, peritoneal relations, blood supply and autonomic innovations. So the large intestine begins at the ileocecal junction and can be divided into four parts, the cecum, the colon, the rectum and the anal canal. It is approximately one and a half metres in length, but this can vary from person to person. It is responsible for absorbing water and salts from the intestinal contents and producing faeces, which are then stored prior to defecation. Now, the large intestine can normally be distinguished from the small due to its greater calibre and predictable location within the abdomen. Close inspection, however, reveals three characteristic external features. There are the amental appendices, also known as the appendices epiplicae, the tina coli, and the hostra. So amental appendices are fatty tags lined by peritoneum that attach along the length of the colon. The tina coli are three thickened bands of smooth muscle that represent the large intestine's longitudinal layer of muscle. These tina coli originate from the appendix as the longitudinal muscle layer splits into three bands and then extends along the entire length of the large intestine to rejoin one another at the recto-sigmoid junction. As the tina coli are shorter than the length of the whole large intestine, the colon forms a series of saccules or pouches and these are known as the haustra. Now these three bands of tina coli can be known as either mesocolic, a mental or free. The mesocolic tina coli have the attachment sites for the transverse and sigmoid mesocolons. The amental tina coli has the amental appendices attaching to it, and the free tina coli has neither the mesocolons or amental appendices attaching to it. So now let's turn to the individual parts of the large intestine and detail the cecum, the colon, and then briefly the rectum and anal canal. So the cecum is a dilated pouch located in the right iliac region of the abdomen. Medially, it is continuous with the ilium at the ileocecal junction, where it forms the ileocecal valve. This valve is thought to regulate the movement of chyme from the ilium into the cecum, and importantly, prevents the regurgitation of chyme back into the ilium. It does not, however, form a sphincter, like the pyloric sphincter, which guards the entrance to the duodenum. The cecum is completely covered by peritoneum and is therefore intraperitoneal and is fairly mobile, but it does not contain a mesentery. Although the cecum is fairly mobile, it rarely moves away from the right iliac region due to a couple of cecal folds, which are extensions of peritoneum that connect the cecum to the lateral abdominal wall. Found on the posteromedial surface of the cecum, and inferior to the ileocecal junction is the appendix. This narrow pouch is an intestinal diverticulum and contains a large collection of lymphoid tissue. It is suspended by the mesopendix which contains the appendicular artery and can be located surgically by finding the tina coli on the descending colon and tracing them inferiorly. Externally the appendix is located deep to McBurney's point a surface anatomy landmark which is a third of the way along an imaginary line from the assis joining the umbilicus. Now if we return to the cecum then it is continuous superiorly with the ascending colon and ascends along the right side of the abdominal cavity towards the liver. As it approaches the liver it turns to the left at the hepatic flexure and then becomes the transverse colon. The ascending colon has peritoneum on its anterior surface and sides, and running along the lateral aspect of the ascending colon is the right paracolic gutter. This is a deep groove lined by peritoneum that forms between the lateral aspect of the ascending colon and the lateral abdominal wall. In the majority of people, the ascending colon is retroperitoneal and does not contain a mesentery, but in approximately 25% of the population, the ascending colon is suspended by a short mesentery. 
The transverse colon is narrower than the ascending part and is considerably more mobile due to the transverse mesocolon that anchors it to the posterior abdominal wall. It extends across the abdomen from the hepatic flexure in the right hypochondrium through the epigastrium and then into the left hypochondrium where it turns inferiorly to become the descending colon at the splenic flexure. At the splenic flexure, the colon is suspended from the diaphragm by the phrenico-colic ligament. Now as I mentioned just a moment ago, the transverse colon is the most mobile part of the large intestine due to the transverse mesocolon. The root of this mesentery leaves the posterior abdominal wall at the inferior border of the pancreas and means this part of the colon is intraperitoneal. The descending colon is similar to the ascending colon and has a covering of peritoneum on its sides and also anterior surface and it again forms the paracolic gutter along its lateral border. These paracolic gutters are important in allowing free fluid or pus to move from one part of the abdomen to another. For example, when a person is supine, fluid in the right paracolic gutter can extend superiorly to the hepatorenal recess. Fluid in the left paracolic gutter can extend inferiorly into the lower recesses of the abdomen that are present between the pelvic organs. Surgically, these paracolic gutters are important in mobilising the ascending or descending colon. As the blood vessels that supply the colon approach it from its medial aspect, the peritoneum that forms the paracolic gutters can be cut, mobilising the colon and minimising the damage to its blood supply. As the descending colon extends inferiorly, it is continuous with the sigmoid colon. The sigmoid colon is highly mobile due to it having a mesentery and is therefore intraperitoneal. It links the descending colon to the rectum and is an important site for storing faeces prior to defecation. The characteristic S-shaped sigmoid colon is variable in length and is anchored to the posterior abdominal wall by the sigmoid mesocolon. This is a long mesentery and its roots run over the left external iliac vessels and also the bifurcation of the left common iliac artery. As the sigmoid colon travels intramedially to assume a midline position, it merges with the rectum at the level of the S3 vertebra. And at the recto-sigmoid junction, the three bands of tina coli rejoin to form a continuous layer of longitudinal muscle that surrounds the rectum. The rectum then passes through the pelvis and loses its contact with the peritoneum, a so-called subperitoneal position, to join the anal canal. As both the rectum and the anal canal are important pelvic structures, I will leave the details about these two terminal parts of the gastrointestinal tract to the pelvis and perineum series. So to finish the podcast, I want to spend some time describing the arterial supply to the large intestine. And just as the duodenum marked the transitional area between the foregut and the midgut, the large intestine marked the transition between the midgut and the hindgut. This means that parts of the large intestine are going to be supplied by two main arteries. The superior mesoteric artery which supplies the midgut and the inferior mesoteric artery which supplies the hindgut. So let's start with the superior mesoteric artery. This runs through the mesentery of the jejunum and the ileum and it gives off a series of jejunal and ileal arteries. Now branching from the right of the superior mesenteric artery are two arteries which supply the cecum and the ascending colon. These are the iliocolic and right colic. The iliocolic artery runs infralaterally to supply the cecum and it approaches the ileocecal junction. It gives off the small appendicular artery. This runs through the mesoappendix and supplies the appendix. Coming off the superior mesoteric artery at more of a right angle is the right colic artery. This extends laterally towards the ascending colon. Now as these initial parts of the large intestine do not have a mesentery, these arteries extend along the posterior abdominal wall and are retroperitoneal. It is important to appreciate that although this description and the pictures you see in textbooks demonstrate a relatively simple and ordered arrangement of these arteries. Identifying these vessels in the cadaver can be fairly tricky. 
It is therefore important to have a good solid understanding of the theoretical distribution of these vessels, but also be open-minded to variation. No two cadavers will be the same, so you should identify the large intestine and name the arteries according to which part they are supplying. Just because your textbook says there is an iliocolic or a right colic in a certain position doesn't always mean it will be like that in your cadaver. So coming off the superior mesenteric artery, in the previous podcast we identified the digenal and the ileal arteries, and now we've just seen the iliocolic and the right colic. So the final artery I want to detail is the middle colic artery. This artery is one of the first branches from the right side of the superior mesenteric. It initially extends superiorly in a retroperitoneal position, but it passes to the transverse colon by running between the two layers of the transverse mesocolon. The arterial supply of the transverse colon is important and it marks a transitional area between two parts of the gastrointestinal tract. The transition from midgut to hindgut is said to be at a point two thirds of the way along the transverse colon, and so the remainder of the large intestine, so that's the last third of the transverse colon, the descending and sigmoid, rectum and the anal canal, are hindgut, and these structures are going to be supplied by the inferior mesenteric artery. The inferior mesenteric artery branches from the aorta at the level of the third lumbar vertebra and immediately gives rise to the left colic artery, and this extends to the descending colon and then terminates by dividing into the sigmoid arteries, which run to the sigmoid colon, and the superior rectal artery, which supplies the rectum. Now importantly, just like the two pancreaticoduodenal arteries that formed complex anastomoses around the pancreas and duodenum, the superior and inferior mesenteric arteries form an important collateral circulation that runs along the inside of the entire colon. This is the marginal artery. So the marginal artery runs parallel to the ascending, transverse and descending parts of the colon and is formed by the right colic, the middle colic, the left colic and sometimes the sigmoidal arteries linking together. So you should be able to appreciate that although the two-thirds of the transverse colon is midgut, via the marginal artery, blood from the inferior mesoteric artery, which principally supplies the hindgut, can also supply parts of the midgut via the marginal artery. This anastomotic circulation is important if the inferior mesenteric artery becomes occluded as a result of atherosclerosis. Patients with an occluded inferior mesenteric artery do not normally suffer complications due to the marginal artery being able to divert blood from the superior mesenteric artery to the hindgut. The venous drainage of the large intestine mirrors that of the arteries, with the colic veins joining either the superior or inferior mesenteric veins to join the portal system of veins and then pass to the liver. And I'll give a much more detailed account of the arteries and portal system of the abdomen in podcast 11. So finally, I just want to address the autonomic innovations of the large intestine, and I'll go over these in far more greater detail in a specific podcast later on in the series. But briefly, the sympathetic fibres will reduce the level of peristalsis and constrict arteries. This allows more blood to be available for skeletal muscles, whilst parasympathetic fibres will increase the level of peristalsis and also digestive juice secretions, and will also increase the level of blood flow to the region. So in this podcast, I've given an overview of the large intestine, which includes the cecum, the appendix, the colon, and very briefly, the rectum and anal canal. In the next podcast, number six, I'll describe the liver and spleen.